The progress of globalism can only be continued if people believe that the party they're voting for is a genuine alternative. Which brings us to the Labour Party. Their new leader, Jacinda Ardern, was brought up as a Mormon. Her father, Ross Ardern, a long-serving police officer, went on to serve as New A's chief of police, and later, after retiring from his 40-year policing career, became New Zealand's High Commissioner to the small Pacific nation. Jacinda was educated at Waikato University, assisted by a Freemason scholarship, which tells you something about her family ties and reflects yet another MP, whose promotion was assisted by select interests, who enforced the status quo power base of the old boys' school tie network. Her background is in public relations. Her parting with the Mormon church came around the same time she first went to work for Phil Goff. Goff is the current mayor of Auckland, a supporter of privatisation who proposed the sale of Auckland's ports. He is also a member of Parliamentarians for Global Action. Jacinda then worked for Helen Clark, Clark is a supporter of privatisation, a proponent of the TPPA, a member of both the Club de Madrid and Parliamentarians for Global Action, who, with support from Key, has made attempts to become the UN's next Secretary General. Jacinda's past employment included a review of policing in the UK and Wales, which was first brought about because of the John Stalker affair in the 1980s, which demonstrated Freemasonry had a strong influence on the UK policing system. A general ban on Freemasons joining the police followed the affair. This widely reported issue was made into several films and dramas, including Irvine Welsh, Filth and Porridge. In 1990 there was again UK media focus on police corruption, pertaining to the abuse of children by senior police officers. However, Jacinda, with assistance from this particular corner of the old boys' school tie network, participated in an orchestrated whitewashing of the issue. The resulting investigations conveniently found nothing, demonstrating yet again that Freemasonry was still in control of the UK police force, with lodges deliberately flouting bans on members joining the police following the stalker affair. Jacinda then went to work for the Better Regulation Authority in the UK, a pro-business agency. It was set up to assist large corporates in the European Union by establishing legislation that both reduced regulations for major corporates and strangled small businesses with red tape. Although we do not have confirmation that Jacinda herself is a member of the Globalist Parliamentarians for Global Action, nearly all of her Labour Party mentors, Goff, Clark and Robertson, are. In 2008, Ardern told Parliament it was unspeakable that New Zealand form a parliamentary select committee to question the science of climate change. In 2011, assisted by members of Parliamentarians for Global Action, Phil Goff and David Shearer respectively, Jacinda shot up the party list, despite having no real profile. Her partner, Clark Gayford, is a well-known TV presenter in the Auckland media crowd and will undoubtedly make sure she gets good press. In summary, Jacinda generally appears to be a career politician, groomed from the start and tipped for a post-election career in the UN, just like Clark. Now that we've got her out of the way, what about the rest of the Labour Party? Firstly, it's a party loaded with members of globalist groups and clubs, parliamentarians for global action, the Club de Madrid, the Freemasons, Old Boy School Tie Network, and almost all their policies support the UN Agenda 21 protocols, global government, and the globalisation ideology in general. Labour opened the door to retrospective law changes, giving politicians a literal get-out-of-jail-free card, instigated a law change allowing people who are not born in New Zealand to become MPs. Labour were the ones responsible for delivering Rogernomics, a neoliberal privatisation policy, to New Zealand's political landscape. And consecutive Labour Prime Ministers such as Mike Moore and Helen Clark also sold strategic assets designed to protect national sovereignty. They're advocates of iwi having a greater say in government, while at the same time, laws like the proposed Māori land court changes seek to give iwi corporate management greater control at the expense of the wider Māori community. The end result being, iwi, as minority partners to multinationals, are now being used to introduce privatisation through the back door. Labour supported the flag change, which if successful, would have introduced a style of republicanism, one which does not contain equal constitutional protection for all of New Zealand, 
or protect its national sovereignty. The symbols offered as a choice were the silver fern or red peak, effectively symbolising iwi dominance in the South Island and West Coast, both of which had already accepted treaty settlements, symbolically coming at the expense of the other iwi yet to settle. In between Labour victories, national governments under Prime Ministers Muldoon, Bolger, Shipley and Key respectively have also sold strategic assets designed to protect national sovereignty. Labour were responsible for introducing the TPPA in addition to brokering both US and Chinese trade deals, all of which facilitate the control of New Zealand by multinationals, owned and controlled by less than 1% of the population. They also instituted the process that will eventually allow the US Food and Drug Administration to regulate our foods and medicines. They provided lip service against US warship visits, even though it was Labour's longing government who initially banned the ships. Labour has remained silent on increased United States and New Zealand military relations, silent on the militarisation of New Zealand's Antarctic Ross Shelf, and silent on the downscaling of New Zealand's presence in Antarctica. They got New Zealand involved in US-based Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts based solely on vague promises of milk deals at a time when American milk was literally being poured down the drain due to an excess of supply. Labour is responsible for the continued escalation of New Zealand military spending. In 1987, it was 1% of the GDP. In 2017, it's at 4% and climbing. Labour's creation of the elite SAS within the New Zealand military was later continued by National, who set them up as a separate fourth arm of the military. Under Longy, the New Zealand SAS budget was increased 34% and has increased with each consecutive government. Labour also increased budgets for New Zealand's intelligence agencies with each consecutive government and are responsible for the creation of Waihopai spy base, beginning the process of mass surveillance on Kiwis by their government. And Labour has again only paid lip service to key security intelligence warning bells. On a final note, Labour also introduced genetic engineering and genetically modified crops into New Zealand's landscape.